All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us for today's webinar on fair sharing for education researchers. Um, I wanted to kick off the call by sort of framing the basic issue that motivated us to host this webinar. So um, researchers are sharing more parts of their research uh, from data to analysis code to research materials to other kinds of supplementary information more than ever before. And one of the major promises of this shared information is that it will be able to be found and reused by others in the community. Yet there are so many pieces that must be in place for research artifacts to be found and for reuse to be made possible. And one major component is that shared materials need to be well described. But what well described means varies depending on context. That description is going to mean something different for a microbiologist than it does for a STEM education researcher. So today's presentation will go into more detail about what is needed for fair sharing of research, and we'll highlight a new integration that just launched on the Open Science Framework that enables researchers to do specialized descriptions of their open research artifacts. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, I'm the host for today's session um, from ASAP Bio. Uh, with me as presenters are Jessica Logan and Sarah Hart, both uh, representing LDBase, a learning and development focused data repository. And we also have today Eric Olson, who's representing the Center for Open Science. Eric is gonna kick us off by reviewing the concept of metadata, which refers to the descriptive information that is needed to make research findable and ultimately reusable. Uh, Eric will go into a bit of detail about how metadata is realized on the OSF before discussing the new integration that makes specialized metadata possible uh, on OSF. And then we'll hear from uh, Sarah and Jessica about how LD Basic repositories metadata it, uh, works and how it's integrated with OSF using CEDAR. And um, we'll close with a demonstration of um, how to discover metadata on the OSF. So I will pass it off now to Eric. All right. Thank you, Katie. Make sure I'm unmuted here. Um, so yeah, as, as Katie mentioned, and I am sure we have a in the audience today a distribution of of comfort and familiarity with um, what metadata is and why it's really important and valuable and how that fits into some of the specifics that uh, Katie alluded to and we're going to get into in our demonstrations today. Um, so just to, to provide the crash course here and a couple of examples, uh, the easiest way to think about what metadata is, is that it is data about data, it is descriptions of data and objects that uh, help orient yourself and your uh, readers to um, what they are uh, experiencing when they're working through your materials. Uh, so just as a few examples here, if we're looking at a, a book or a digital um, article that is itself an artifact that is data. Um, and then there is data about data. Uh, if you look at um, Google Books, there's lots of metadata about the book that um, you may want to read. So a description of who the authors are, how long it is, who published it, all of those things are examples of metadata you use all the time, uh, maybe not realizing it, um, but you're using those constantly. Um, looking at some NIH uh, artifacts here, uh, we've got data in this you know, newsletter, uh, and then we have metadata about that same artifact. So again, things you're using all the time. Um, get a picture here of one of our cats uh, from one of our metadata experts here on the team. Uh, that a picture of a cat is data, it's an artifact, uh, and there is metadata about pictures uh, about of cats. Um, and then on the OSF, which we'll see a couple of examples of, Today, um, we have one of our workflows here in OSF project. There's lots of data that uh, you can store and organize on an OSF project, uh, including um, uh, directories of information and, and files. Uh, and then there is metadata uh, about all of that information that you're storing and organizing uh, on your OSF project. 
there is a dedicated metadata page. We're going to see a bit of this as we move forward today. Um, for those OSF objects, you get even more information about who and uh, what kind of information this is and who supported or funded it. Uh, so really uh, useful information for you uh, to define your uh, your data, your materials. And uh, there's you know ways of looking at this um, that are you know, hopefully very noticeable when you're sharing or looking for data. Um, you can recognize pretty quickly um, if uh, an object has good metadata and if there were good data management practices. And then there's even more opportunities for really well-described data uh, and materials, um, like if a study has been uh, pre-registered, if there's effective study designs available, logging in previous versions, code, um, raw data, things like that, that will add uh, significantly to uh, the data that you're sharing, uh, in addition to have really uh, effective metadata. And just as a to put this in the whole framework of what we do uh, at COS and as well as um, organizations like our uh, other speakers today that value open science, there's, there's many, many practices that we talk about, but uh, metadata being a core piece of that, a foundational piece of those practices that um, you're going to utilize at every, uh, hopefully at every opportunity and can add a lot of value to your research and your work. And uh, Katie alluded to um, FAIR earlier, uh, and just to quickly um, uh, identify what that refers to um, is that the, the highest level is that metadata and data can be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and through our examples, um, we'll be able to, to realize together how we check those boxes when we um, can submit um, and share our data. And the reasons for doing this are, are myriad, but um, a couple of recent examples, if you're in the US in particular, um, but elsewhere uh, globally, there is, um, and even before uh, some of the US policies last year um, have a, an expectation of data sharing and effective metadata for that data sharing. So if you haven't already been, you know, had a recent grant that you submitted to the NIH for your next one, um, you will have to have data management and sharing plans and be able to articulate how you'll be defining your data uh, with metadata. And we try to make this as easy as possible through the, the OSF for you to do exactly that. So um, we use the data site uh, metadata schema, which is a standard that a lot of repositories use. Um, we have controlled lists of for a number of our fields, like the funders and resource types I mentioned earlier. So you don't have to know precisely how to spell your funder. Um, you can just begin typing it and you can choose from a list. It's ready for persistent identifiers, which are going to be a critical part of um, those expectations, policy expectations I mentioned earlier. So we have identifiers for people, places, and things, um, and ways to connect all of the relationships to connect the various outputs from your research. So you don't just have a paper. Uh, you can have paper that connects to your data and to your code and to your materials, uh, and the OSF can facilitate that for you. Um, and we have on the OSF um, behind the scenes an application profile that defines all of the models that our, our metadata uh, is built around. Um, so if you really want to know how that all works, then it's a public uh, application profile for our metadata. Um, and you can also define all of these things at the, at the file level as well, um, specific metadata. And just to give you a sense of what this looks like, because uh, you do all of these things on the OSF and that can add value just within the platform, but uh, the real, real value downstream comes from where this starts to appear outside of the OSF. So this just one example here of a one of the data management sharing plans that we produced for an NIH study. It has funder information in here and has the uh, author, it has a resource type. These are all things that are discoverable in the OSF, um, just uh, pointing out a few of those. There's a person ID, um, some of those choose list from state uh, from data site, 
There's a Crossref uh, funder registry identifier here for NIH. And now that when we send that information to data site to min a DOI for that data management and sharing plan, those data site uh, fields that were chosen like the licenses are all available in that metadata. There's an ORCID ID for the contributor. There's a, a, a organizational ID for her affiliation. And there's the Crossref uh, funder registry ID uh, in there for NIH. And all of that now is discoverable in the NIH index. Um, the contributors also synced her ORCID record with her data, uh, the data site index, and that automatically populates in her ORCID record as well uh, with all of that same information. So lots of opportunities uh, within the OSF to take advantage of um, you know, those standards. And so uh, as Katie alluded to earlier, what uh, is difficult for any uh, repository uh, is to have opportunities for communities that have really specialized kinds of data about data um, to provide them ways to, to submit and include that information and make it discoverable um, in a generalized repository like the OSF, which is going to collect really useful metadata like those that we just looked at, but is only can get so specialized while still being able to support the, that general uh, purpose. Um, but there's this really great uh, organization and tool um, developed at a, the Center for Expanded Data Annotation and Retrieval, which is out of uh, Stanford University. And th this was their entire uh, goal was to uh, enable exactly this kind of um, uh, discovery and refinement of, in their case, to begin with, biomedical metadata that has a lot of these specialist needs. Uh, so what they have developed is an end-to-end -end process that enables communities and organizations to develop their own metadata standards. There's a tool for developing that. Um, curators can use those templates to then define uh, their um, the metadata for these specialized experiments or other materials. Uh, and then ways for repositories and other research tools to then integrate those exact templates into workflows so that uh, researchers can easily take advantage of them. Uh, so that is what we have uh, built into the OSF this year. So this is a, a project space like the one we saw in the, in the earlier example. And if we look at the metadata for this project, we have those the same ones we described but then we have this uh, button up here to add a, a stand metadata standard from a specific community. And there's several options uh, already in the OSF for utilizing this. Uh, and then in this example here, uh, I'm using one called the PsychDS, was a psychology uh, metadata standard. And now I have a whole form of very specialized uh, metadata that's gonna be collected through this form that uh, once I've completed, just to give you a sense of what that looks like there to complete a, the form. Once I've completed that form, it's stored on that OSF object and can be um, read and downloaded uh, just as with the data itself and uh, the OSF metadata with that object. Uh, so it provides lots of opportunities to define uh, specialized data materials in ways that um, I couldn't previously with just the, the OSF metadata because I have these specialized uh, forms. Uh, so to get into even more uh, detail on a, a really great example of exactly this, um, turn it over to uh, Jessica and Sarah to describe LDBase. Yeah, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm here to quickly introduce LD Base, and we're one of we represent one of the communities, one of the data repositories that has been made specifically for a community. And part of our creation of LD Base was to also come up with metadata standards for our community. And I think that's why we're here. Uh, so what is LD Base? Uh, LD Base, or you can find it at ldbase.org, is an NIH-supported domain-specific repository. Um, we store behavioral data related to learning and development, uh, which is kind of what the LD base, the LD stands for. What I mean by that is that the data that um, we uh, ingest and store and share data that can be stored in flat uh, spreadsheets 
that is related to individuals learning context or individuals learning outcomes. So that's kind of our niche community that we serve as a data repository. So this means that LDBase is a, a bespoke data repository and the functionality of LDBase was optimized for the field it was created to serve. Uh, so as such, um, we allow a hierarchical and flexible data storage. We allow data, code, and documents to be stored as an investigator wishes under uh, the uh, the uh, kind of a, a metadata, uh, sorry, a, a meta uh, component called a project. Uh, there, uh, when we first started building LD Base, there were no metadata standards for our field, and so we created them, and that's why we're here today. Uh, so in LD Base, data can be uploaded to be stored on LD Base. Um, or linked to a file that's stored elsewhere. We allow versioning of files. We allow various uh, data viewing and downloading permission levels to be set by the investigators storing their data. Uh, the system LD base is a system uh, can assist requests uh, for data that's been embargoed. Uh, we allow DII, we provide DOI minting and allow flexible data like a uh, flexible licensing uh, selection by investigators. And finally, thanks to the rich metadata that we've created, LDBase uh, is, has very good search functioning to be able to find data, uh, code, or documents related to any kind of construct or area within the field. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jess, who's gonna do a walkthrough of how our metadata that we created for LDBase is going to be, or has been integrated in OSF. Um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about what this LD Base taxonomy actually captures. So, within, um, because of how LD Base was designed um, and the community it was designed to serve, it includes key terms and descriptors for projects in the field of education and developmental science. So, for learning and development projects. So, um, the LD Base taxonomy itself that we have integrated within to the OSF includes terms related to projects methodologies, uh, the project design. The constructs that are assessed as part of the uh, data set that that will eventually be stored on LD Base, and then uh, the focal participants that are involved in the project. Um, so these terms for this taxonomy, the the categories were designed like what what data we would collect was designed by field experts, and then the actual terms within each category were initially generated or seeded by experts, and then more organically terms were generated by the community while they were using LDBase. So as people were depositing their data sets into LDBase, adding extra key terms uh, within each of these categories. So that's how we ended up with the terms that we have. Um, what I'm gonna do as I walk through this demonstration is I'm imagining a study, because that we're using this data, you know, we're gonna use a data repository um, or we're going to use the OSF to talk about storing documents like maybe your pre-registration or supplemental files or preprints that might go uh, might that you might want to store on uh, on the OSF that you'll need to have or would want to have metadata descriptions of. So to that end, I sort of came up with an imaginary study that we're going to go through the uh, metadata fields for um, and fill it out. So. I'm imagining a study that's testing the efficacy of a math intervention that's designed to improve both math and math anxiety. Um, I'm focused on third grade children who have ADHD, and I'm going to longitudinally follow these kids for two years in this study. I'm going to assess the ADHD symptomology using the SWAN or the, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, something that, the A stands for ADHD, which I find hilarious. And then we're going to assess, uh, plan to assess math with the Peabody Individual Achievement Test or the PIAT. Um, okay, and with that, I'm going to take over sharing and sort of show you what this looks like. Okay, so from here, uh, what I've done here is created a test project called reading development, which is incorrect because I thought it was going to be reading development and then I decided it would be math. That's okay. We can all use our imaginations. So from here, as Eric sort of demonstrated in the screenshots, there's a little tab up here called metadata. And if you click on the metadata tab, it will load up into the standard metadata pieces that Eric walked through. And this is all also relatively new, not what we're here to demonstrate, but 
they have um, additional metadata pieces here that are searchable. Now the community metadata standards is where LD base is, which is hiding up here in the top corner. So if you click on the community metadata standards, here are all of the options. And if you scroll down, here's ours, um, LD base. The LD base template is for projects in the field of education, learning, and human development. So that's our little guide to help you pick it. Um, once you're here, we have a little bit of an explainer about that sort of walks through all the pieces that I just explained to you in our slides to talk through um, how that, like what the goal is of this metadata um, taxonomy. Um, so what we're asking for here is because these metadata records are going to live on their own, so they need to be identifiable on their own as well. So they'll be linked to your project, but you can also search them and download them on their own. So we ask you to add in the project name that will be the same as the project that you'd use for uh, the associated OSF project. So I think I called this example, I'm gonna say it's math project. So here's our example math project. And then the first field that you'll see is called participant types. Um, and then Cedar has a little, indicator that you can add multiple records using this little parentheses here. So one means this is the first record and it can go all the way up to infinite number of uh, different participant types. And so what we're asking you to do here is to select a term that best describes the participants in your project. And so what does that mean? If you click here, you can sort of see all of the options of the different types of participants for the project. Uh, so for us, we're studying children because this is about kids who are in third grade. So I'm going to select children from this list. And I'm not actually studying any of these other uh, fields. So I'm going to skip to the next one. The next thing I have, uh, we have here is special populations. The special populations would be if you're selecting specific people or sp selecting a specific uh, type of population or type of sample for your project, then we would want you to select that here. So what's a special population? A great question. A special populations that we have listed here include oftentimes you might select children for a study of, of reading for reading difficulties. You might select uh, that particular sample. Um, me, I said we were selecting children with ADHD. So you can click here and select from our list of key terms. You can also just say, um, type it in, and then it will find theoretically anything that has to do with that ter key term. I think it's got to start with it for this one, maybe in the development mode. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Jess, uh, right, while so I have ADHD. you, mm -hmm. I was sort of curious, um, maybe you could add a second record just to demonstrate how the adding a second record works so that, because that process is a little bit wonky. I am so glad that you asked, because if you remember, I have two primary constructs I'm going to assess. Look at here, within our, our uh, actual constructs we're going to assess, we're clearly going to assess ADHD, because that's one of the things we're looking for. And then to add an additional record, there's this little button right here. It says they, it's called add empty after current. So then you can add a second one. So you can see the first one gets sort of added right here. And then you can add a second one right here. So I'm looking for math achievement. I'm measuring math. And then I'm going to add another record because I'm also measuring math anxiety. Come on, baby. There we go. So now I have all three of these records associated with it. So we've set it up so that you don't have to fill them all out, but there's additional information here. You can pick specific assessments. Um, again, these were generated as part of this uh, process of uh, us seeding it and then people adding additional terms as they continued to use it. Uh, we also have developmental design where you can select information. Uh, remember I said I'm following these kids for two years. So that would be maybe a longitudinal study following them over time. Within project methodologies, this is an opportunity uh, to enter in information across the different types of methods that people might use within our field. Uh, this one in particular, maybe a, a randomized control trial or a quasi-experiment. I didn't come up with that very specifically within my scenario, but I love randomized control trials, so we're gonna pretend. So once you've filled out all of that information, you can submit it and then 
as Eric showed you, once you click on the metadata tab for that project, you have the standard metadata, and then you also have the um, metadata specifically that's come in through the LDBase project. So it's stored like this. Here's our title, and then here's our key terms. Looks like that. And then here are our three terms that we entered all at once on our constructs tab. Okay, the last thing I wanted to show you is that as Eric also alluded to, you know, this is part of a project here, but you can also do that for specific pieces of information. So this right here is a pre-registration that I have filed on the OSF. So within my pre-registration, this is sort of my standard pre-registration that I filed in 2019. Even on the specific piece of information, you can add the same community metadata standards. So it will let you add this information just to a specific document. So it follows through exactly the same uh, process as we went through before, but then you have an additional metadata tag there along with that second document. Um, okay, so that will do it for me. I'm gonna turn it back over to you. All right, thanks Jessica. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna switch back to slide deck here. <clears throat> All right, um, and then yeah, before we jump into uh, Q and A, I just wanted to to give you a sense of what um, it looks like if you're on the uh, the other end. You're one of real just fascinated by uh, the research that Jessica just told us about, and you want to see if on the OSF. Uh, if already have, has someone come in and used those uh, templates to define their uh, projects. So in our uh, discovery interface, uh, there is a brand new filter here uh, to only, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in addition to all the other filters that you might apply to only give you results uh, for um, uh, projects or registrations that have applied one of those uh, community schemas, uh, the metadata schemas. Uh, so we've seen, as you see here, just a few of these getting picked up already. Um, we've even added an additional, um, not just a new version of LDBase recently, but another uh, template altogether in the last few weeks. Uh, so we we'll expect to see these keep um, going up. Um, whoop, sorry. Um, in the future, we want to support even deeper discovery where, um, as you can see on our on the search interface here, all of those default metadata fields that we have on the OSF, you can um, use those as, as filters to find only things that have a <clears throat> particular license or funded by a particular funder. Um, and so we want to bring some of that discovery power to uh, those kinds of fields that Jessica just showed us. Um, so. Currently, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, you will find uh, those forms, the, those metadata submissions through um, just isolating content that has those forms uh, related to them. Um, but in the future, want to have those be discoverable through the general searches and additional filters. So something to, to look forward to. Um, and yeah, with that, I want to open it up for questions. Um, there is a, a form at the end of the slide deck here. Um, if you have a community that's already developed um, one of those Cedar templates or you're, you're considering that, um, then you can request uh, to have a chat with us. And then um, if it seems well aligned, then we could apply uh, that uh, standard and make it available on the OSF in the same way um, that we saw with uh, LD Base today. Um, so that'll be on the, the slides that you get um, after the webinar today. Um, so yeah, I think there's some couple of questions coming in. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. I'll, uh, we do have a couple questions, but I think, um, I'll take the prerogative and ask the first question. And while I do that, people can, if there are more questions, people can go ahead and answer them in the, or enter them into the Q and A. 
Um, so my question is, um, what other kinds of specialized metadata templates have already been made available on the OSF? So we have the LD base one, of course, but there are four others. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those? I sure can. Um, and I'll actually, um, but can let me close that here? Uh, I will bring up just, uh, one of my test projects that I use just for this kind of thing. Um, and I can show you the five that we have currently available. And every user, if you have an, an OSF uh, account, um, you can utilize these. They're, they're not limited by any uh, user roles or anything like that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have LD base that we just uh, just talked about and Jessica showed us, uh, and the site DS that I also just sort of briefly uh, mentioned, which is um, documenting psychology related uh, data sets. Um, there is one also for um, human cognitive neuroscience data. So again, being able to define the, the specifics of neuroscience data um, and Metabus, um, which is a template for um, applied uh, psychology research. So there's a theme here um, for most of these, as you uh, notice. Um, these are actually communities that uh, Katie uh, brought together uh, to, they were in, in this process of thinking through their metadata standards, as Jessica and uh, Sarah told us about with LD Base. Uh, and so we worked closely um, with them as they were working through that um, and then eventually developed their uh, Cedar templates uh, so that we can integrate those here. Um, so that's their that's the relationship between these uh, these four. Um, and then we also uh, have added a a more general um, data site uh, schema which has fields that we don't collect by default. Uh, on the OSF. So, you know, some of the slightly more specialized um, fields, if you wanted to take advantage of those, you'd be able to by just adding the uh, the enhanced metadata uh, form. Um, so yeah, there's, there's no limits in terms of uh, what we could do here. Um, so that any kind of community could um, come work with us to add their, um, develop their, their forms on uh, Cedar and then have those integrated um this just happens to be a, a whole group that moved forward with us um, when we first launched the the product yeah thanks eric yeah i'll just say a little bit about the um the osf enhanced metadata one because that one actually has some really neat options for a variety of researchers um it has uh as one neat feature the ability to add information, more information about contributor roles than is currently available on the OSF. Um, so it's not the credit taxonomy, but it is the data site equivalent of credit taxonomy that lets you say, you know, the outline the specific roles that people have had on a project. So if you had a preprint, for instance, or a registration, and you wanted to say a little bit more about what each particular author or contributor had done on that project, you'd be able to do so using this additional metadata form. There's also um, more detailed information about geography. So for people who are doing research where, um, you know, you, the geography of the object being described, the data or the file or what have you, it, where that's relevant, you're able to um, provide information um, at a pretty detailed level about geography, which is kind of a nice um, additional feature. Um, okay, so I'll, I have a question for the uh, LD base folks, and then I'll get into the, um, the audience questions. So one question was um, uh, about other types of contexts that you might imagine that your template might be suitable for beyond learning and development research projects. So certainly it is very specialized for use within those contexts, but I think there might be some potential, you know, broader applicability for other types of research. So I was just curious about your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, Certainly some, you know, like picking types of designs uh, and even participant types, you know, we focus mostly on the kind of the learning side, which is kind of how developmental science really overlaps with educational uh, research. 
Uh, but certainly investigators who are in educational research but don't see an overlap with developmental science and developmental scientists who don't see the overlap with education could definitely find um, uses for our metadata. You might not want to use every field, but not every field is a requirement. And so you could use what you want. So like, oh, yes, the the project methodology is really useful to me. It is helpful for me to say this is an RCT or this is a random uh, that same thing, randomized controlled trial or an individual differences project, or it's useful for me to say how many time points in my longitudinal design and to tag that into my project. Um, so I do think uh, that other people kind of outside the field will find pieces that are going to be useful to uh, more richly describe their products on the OSF, uh, which then will just make it more discoverable and easier to search uh, the OSF than it is currently. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. One of the things that was really exciting to me about um, LD Base as a partner for this project was um, also the sort of potential uh, for interoperability between the two repositories. So you can easily imagine researchers storing their data on LD Base, but as Jess mentioned, storing other research artifacts like registrations or um, you know other study documentation on OSF. And by having compatible metadata across the two, uh, systems. It makes it possible for other uh, researchers to come along later and develop tools that make it possible to um, to search and discover things across the two different spaces. It's a really um, interesting possibility that I think could be applicable to other communities as well, um, where you know specialized things are stored in in discipline specific repositories, but other more general information is stored in general generalized repositories like the OSF. Um, okay, I've got a question for Eric, I believe, from the um, from the Q&A. Is there a way to batch create all metadata in the OSF uh, by uploading a standardized file like JSON or similar? Uh, currently, there is not. Um, we have some features that are you know, corollaries to that, so it's not... Um, it's not something that's out of the, the realm of possibility, um, even in the you know not distant future, but uh, currently we don't have that as a, as a feature. I will say one way to access these metadata um, instances once they are uploaded is using the API. So although you can't batch upload them, you can batch download them, um, and it, but it requires some, some knowledge of how the API works. And I believe, um, there's potentially some more documentation on that uh, capability coming later this year. Um, all right, one more question about OSF metadata. Can metadata be edited? And if so, does OSF uh, version the metadata or just update it? Can more than one person contribute to the metadata? Uh, so yes, more than one, uh, anyone who has at least right uh, permissions um, can edit the, both the OSF metadata and um, metadata that's in the CEDAR forms. Um, the, as you update OSF metadata, the, all of those actions are logged, every you know, in particular action. Um, with the CEDAR forms, they though like a, the action of a CEDAR form being applied is logged, but not every change uh, is not versioned. Um, but you can have multiple uh, contributors that can, can come in and, and modify them. Okay. Um, I have another question here about um, FAIR metadata templates for research collaboration. Um, the question is, what about tracking or indicating if research is or has been replicated to address problems of reproducibility in social behavioral research? So I guess this question is maybe more for, for Jess and Sarah. Um, as you were you know, working to develop the metadata for LD Base, it, did you come across any other metadata standards that um, were addressing issues of, related to replication and reproducibility? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't think, yeah, I don't think so, right? The metadata that we're talking about here is really kind of describing the products that are in LD Base and now the products within OSF. Um, and I could see that being a descriptor. We just, I haven't, 
being any community standards from other communities I'm, uh, to help us apply what that metadata would look like. And we didn't consider organically within our team that that would be a metadata standard that we would create and implement. Yeah. But yeah, an interesting I, idea. Yeah, I also didn't come across this as I was doing research for sort of communities to collaborate with. Um, so it doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist, but I, I was not familiar with it either. Um, I'm intrigued by the idea of a sort of general metadata standard that would allow one to classify whether a study is a replication, for example. That could be, I think, useful, mm -hmm. um, probably um, maybe more for registrations than for um, other types of metadata. And that's something actually we've toyed around with a little bit in some of the um, registration template working group work that, um, that we've done. Um, okay, another question for LD-based folks. How are the terms controlled? Um, there's an example in the text here about ADHD, if you want to take a look at that. I think there's yeah. probably two answers. That's why Jess is trying to respond and I'm trying to respond. Uh, I'll say according to on LD-based, right? So LD-based, the vocabularies are still open. Uh, so we don't have a controlled closed vocabulary. So uh, community members to, can still contribute to the vocabularies. Uh, um, and part of our internal process of the team that works on LD base is we look for like these examples, uh, duplicates uh, that, and then we clean that up on the back end. So if somebody puts in ADHD as well as attention deficit disorder, you know, that then we would combine them uh, and make them into one term at the back end. Uh, so that at least we have an open vocabulary at LD base. I think the answer is different for the, how the vocabulary is being used on OSF. Yeah, on OSF, it's closed now. So part of the uh, way that the CEDAR integration works, what we've done is gone through the most commonly used terms within LD base and then uh, refined the list to, to, to those like most commonly used terms that we uh, see and then have published that taxonomy on on um, online on bioportal so it's an it's a published open text a published taxonomy or ontology there on bioportal so with cedar is drawing from our published online unique terms uh, so it's closed now on OSF. You can only enter in terms that already exist. You cannot add additional terms. Yeah, and I think the ideal situation would be that, you know, this is a resource that um, could continue to develop sort of over the time scale of mm -hmm. years, not very quickly. But, you know, you could imagine that um, there might right now it's on version two. There might eventually be a version three where, you know, additional terms are added to the to the vocabulary. Mm hmm. Um, I can field this question, I think. Um, the question is, can metadata from LD base be ingested into OSF or from OSF to LD base, or does the researcher need to re-enter the metadata? Currently, it needs to be re-entered independently in each system. Um, however, because the standards are compatible, you could imagine a future in which someone develops a tool that would enable this kind of connectivity. So it doesn't exist currently, but it's within the realm of possibility for someone with the right developer skill set. Um, Go okay. ahead and start working on it. We're ready. <laughs> it would be awesome. We, uh, I would love to see it. I mean, I'm, I'm personally very excited by the idea of this, like I said, connectivity between different kinds of services like this. Um, okay, so I've got an, one last question, I think, um, from uh, my list of questions I came up with to, to seed things here. So I think I'll go with the more provocative one. Um, for, we'll have all three of you answer. <laughs> If you could wave a magic wand and improve metadata description of open research artifacts, what would you most want to see better described and why? Like what kinds of information do you wish researchers were telling people about the stuff that they're sharing, their data sets, their projects, their re registrations, any of that kind of stuff? I can uh, start because I've got kind of a uh, a pocket answer for this kind of thing um, is r researchers and and other stakeholders uh, around it, around them. Um, if they were using the PIDs that are already available to them frequently uh, and, uh, you know, 
correctly, although um, you know, the infrastructure is doing a lot to help with, with that part, uh, then a lot of the processes, especially the non-research, like the experiments themselves, all the other work that's around that um, can be reduced dramatically if we're all being really consistent about uh, using the identifiers and, and other metadata too, but APIDS being a really specific example that uh, has a lot of, of outreach and resources related to them and how to use them and when to use them and opportunities that, uh, you know, we're generally in research communities getting better about, but there's still lots of opportunities to um, improve both from a technical and a sort of social practical standpoint. So that's what I would say. Yeah. And Eric, could you just really quickly say for sort of a, a new a person who might be new to this concept, what a PID is and why it's important? Yeah. So um, PIDs, we alluded to very briefly earlier, um, persistent identifiers that are um, uh, unique identifiers for uh, the big three being people, places, and things. Um, so you can define a person, a place, and a thing through an identifier that is uh, is not going to it's not a URL, it'll just disappear when the, your university website changes. It's not a name that you probably share with lots of people all over the world. Um, they're unique and resolvable. Um, and so provide lots of, of opportunities, not just from the you know social confusion perspective, but um, technical opportunities to relate objects and find objects um, at a, a scale that is, is actually pretty uh, impressive um, that is only starting the, the graph of all of those identifiers working together. We're really starting to see the benefit of that. Uh, but the more researchers and communities that use them, uh, the more impressive that's all going to get. Uh, so um, real opportunities to all pull each other, you know, up and forward uh, by, by doing that. Very cool. Thanks. Uh, Jess or Sarah? Uh, the one I'm most excited for people to use, at least on the LD Bay side, is constructs. Um, that that is something that I think will really help uh, people who are doing research in similar areas find one another. Um, so that from the purely LD Bay side, that's the one I'm the most excited about. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was gonna say I've kind of two pronged answer. I think uh, I'll go with my more narrow answer first. Um, yeah, the thinking about data sharing, right, which is what we think about with LD based primarily, you know, we really did come up with these metadata standards to best capture everything we could think about for people who are sharing their data for people to reuse their data. And so to be honest, having uh, investigators who are sharing their data fully use and, you know, put in all of these metadata labels when they're sharing their data is the best with it, you know, what I would love for people to do, uh, because that will then allow for data reuse. If you've ever had to use someone else's data and you get it and you don't know what it's in there, this metadata really can help uh, the really kind of broaden and, um, uh, you know, like, expand the power of data reuse. And so fully using the terms really kind of um, taking the time to uh, select the right metadata labels as you're ingesting your data into LDBase or other products into OSF, using these uh, metadata templates will really allow reuse, which I think is would be so important for our field uh, and capitalize on all of this knowledge that's already sitting in data sets sitting everywhere. Uh, and my more broad answer is, uh, which is not quite what you asked, but I'll say I, I, I the interoperability idea, this idea that um, that these these tools, we hear a lot from our community that there's kind of a lot of tools and where to start and which one to use, how do you select the correct tool. It's starting to feel a little overwhelming for a lot of investigators. And the idea that these tools can work together, you know, we are optimized, LD base is optimized to be the perfect place to store behavioral data related to learning and development. Um, we are very purposely then not the right place to store, say, pre-registrations, because OSF had already become the perfect place to store or a uh, pre-registration. But we created LD base so that you could, you know, rather than re-uploading a, you know, a, a pre-registration at LD base, instead you could use the metadata in LD base and then link to it 
uh, at OSF where it's sitting and stored, rather than kind of that clunky workaround, which is what we've had, now having these systems really try to work together and talk to each other and say, oh, okay, I'm a behavioral researcher in educational science, um, but I also collect video data. LDBase is not the right place for video data, but there is a domain specific repository in our field for video data. And having these, you know, this interoperability across these different tools that exist for researchers, I think is super exciting. And I would like to see that continue to move forward. Yeah, those are excellent points. And it, it reminds me too that there's some um, syncing up happening here with, you know, requirements that are coming down uh, the pipe from from federal funders and things like that. Like in terms of, you know, NSF, NIH, DOE, all of these different funders are, you know, uh, now requiring investigators to share data along with their um there are other research outputs like publications and the the implementation for um, a, the majority of these um, policies is is turning out to be using PIDs, like Eric said, uh, you know, the DOIs and so on from these artifacts to be able to link from specific disciplinary repositories and other places up to uh, to the funder. So it makes it easy to comply as well with those those funder requirements with that, without a lot of uh, duplication of effort in terms of re-entering information over and over again. Um, so yeah, that that's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much to all of the presenters and thank you um, to everyone who was able to join us today. We hope you uh, learned a little bit more about metadata and how it's implemented uh, both on OSF and on LDBase, and uh, we're excited for you to try out these tools. Thanks.